has written a number of books. Highly recommend getting and reading and absorbing theory you, as well as present thing. As UNDP is gearing up for a new quarter of leadership on the country level, as we are gearing up for further scaling the emerging concept of country platforms and are also scaling up our work on delivering services of integrated policy advice through labs, SDG Acceleration Labs. We are looking for inspirational work outside of UNDP and Otto's work on theory U in terms of mindset shifts. Otto's work, he's the co-founder of the global um, lab for transforming capitalism on the country level, very much in pursuit of the SDGs. This is one of the first addresses that comes to mind when we look at inspirational work that embraces systems thinking and really looking at transformation across sectors um, for social and human development. And it's really our great honor to have you here today for this conversation. And without further ado, you told me to keep it short. I hand over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. Um, hello, everyone. Also uh, remotely. Um, so I'm, I'm very surprised. It's September, uh, lunchtime, no lunch, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's just kind of the two or three of us here. So uh, thanks for this uh, busy um, uh, time, um, uh, for making the time. Uh, I hope I can be relevant for what you are trying to do. Um, UNDP. So when I was a student, the development. I mean, UNDP always has been an inspiration for me, kind of pushing things forward. And I think uh, I understand that you are in a situation kind of where there is kind of a little bit like an inflection point, kind of where you can actually uh, uh, imagine your future and maybe the role you play kind of um, in, in, in the bigger world of, uh, world of development in a new way. So, and, I, and I, if I can be of any use of that, um, or maybe kind of um, uh, help your conversation uh, in that direction, um, I would be very happy. And, um, I would be, I'm, you know, living in Boston. It's a short uh, train trip, so uh, I'm uh, always happy to come out for any continuation here, in case that would be uh, useful. So I want to um, maybe kick off the conversation with um, a few remarks, um, a, a little bit kind of on the framework that uh, uh, we have been developing uh, at MIT, and then some of the applications and some of the questions that I. Uh, 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 that I consider key and that might be kind of useful also for your uh, uh, consideration. Um, so I came to MIT some 20 plus years ago from, from Europe, uh, in fact, kind of from, uh, uh, from Germany. And um, the reason was um, action research. Uh, it was kind of the, um, I wanted to learn how as a researcher, I could be more helpful, more useful for people who actually um, doing these things in the field that I was, uh, you know, describing kind of uh, in my research. So how can I be helpful as a researcher? That was really, and I joined the uh, MIT Learning Center, which as you know, may know, is an outgrow of the uh, System Dynamics Group, right, which uh, was the, 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 you know, it's basically the same institute that in 72 kind of uh, uh, created the Limits to Growth study that was uh, pub published uh, uh, under that title. So it's, um, uh, that's a little bit the lineage, and uh, I would say 20 years ago, systems thinking, um, uh, most people would refer to in terms of the first three levels that you see here. What is systems thinking? It's basically the distinction between symptoms and root issues, right? Well, that's kind of basically what you do. So systems thinking claims it's not good enough to uh, respond against the symptoms, to react against the symptoms. You need to, A, figure out, what the deeper root issues are, and B, find a way how we can address them in a more meaningful way. And so there's like symptoms, structures, mental models, thoughts, right, kind of mindsets. But what I would say, uh, so that was basically uh, how you would have framed that 20 years ago. And I think what has happened in the field of systems change is that we have seen the emergence of a fourth level. So in this framework here, it's referred to as source. But I, instead of source, kind of the deeper sources from which we operate, right? Um, uh, instead of source, I could have also written consciousness, right? Consciousness in terms of the deeper sources from which our attention and our action is originating from. 
So what I'm going to present to you is basically a, a framework of awareness-based systems change, right? And if you, um, if I have to summarize that framework with three sentences, I would choose the following three sentences. The first one is, you cannot understand a system unless you change it, right? Well known, it's Kurt Lewin, the founder of Action Research, right? Who basically kind of claims that, you know, uh, you really need to engage with the change process. And that's why all of us here kind of are a much better community than maybe more remote researchers, right? Because it's coming from the, the doing that gives us the more relevant access, uh, the access to the more relevant knowledge. Number two, you cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness. So that's what I'm saying. And it's basically kind of uh, boiling down what I have seen and what I have seen many others describing. So if you just kind of tinker with the structures and processes and so on, the same people will create the same type of problems that you had before. We need to really, uh, particularly in all the multi-stakeholder issues that we have, we need to shift the mindset from a silo to a systems view, or to use another uh, word that you know uh, I, I have been using for the same thing. Uh, we need to shift the mindset from uh, ego system awareness to ecosystem awareness. So ecosystem awareness uh, meaning an awareness that is including the perspectives of all, particularly the most marginalized, but also kind of uh, that is focusing on the well-being of the whole, right? Kind of that has an eye for that. All right, that's number two. Number three. I don't know whether we can get rid of this. Uh, <laughs> you cannot, but maybe I remember what I wrote. <laughs> That's a good test. <laughs> you, you cannot transform consciousness unless you make the system sense and see itself. Right? So let me say that again. You cannot transform consciousness unless you make the system, which is kind of all the different stakeholders, so traditional systems thinking would say you cannot transform the system unless you make the system see itself, right? But now in theory, we go one step further because then it's still in your head, right? I know about everything that's broken and so on, and then if it's stuck in the head, what happens? Nothing, right? We have the knowing doing again. So that's why in theory, we say you, um, uh, you cannot transform consciousness unless you make the system see and sense itself. I need to feel the pain of the most marginalized. If I don't feel it, we are not transforming the way we interact in, our, uh, uh, in that stakeholder group. So that's basically when I work with uh, client systems with multi-stakeholder group, that's what I, I believe I get my money for, to do that make the system sense itself. It's the essence of um, the system's intervention. Why? Because that's the moment where the consciousness is shifting from a silo to a system's view, if you do that as a, in a microcosm, as a collective experience. So that's um, up front. So that's basically this three-sentence summary, right? And then kind of the rest of it is okay, how do you do that? What are the uh, enabling environments and so on and so forth? But you know, if you boil it down to three sentences, it's basically those three. And I'm aware that particularly the, uh, the third one may sound a little abstract, and what does it look like and so on. So I will come to that a little bit. All right, so, um, so that's kind of the vertical dimension of this one page summary, what you see here of, of systems thinking, right? Kind of there's a fourth level, that's kind of the first thing I said. And the fourth level has to do with shifting uh, consciousness, shifting awareness from ego to ego, right? So that's kind of what, what, what uh, differentiates successful from not successful multi-stakeholder um, actions, processes. But what do we see at the top? The three uh, clusters, right, kind of, uh, so, of problem symptoms, ecological divide, social divide, spiritual divide. Right, so the ecological divide basically arises from a disconnect between self and nature, social divide disconnects self and other. Ritual divide arises from a disconnect between self and self, between 
who I am today and who I could be tomorrow. So my kind of highest future potential, right? So if, if those two selves, my small S self, my capital S self are not well, well connected or not connected at all, what do I feel? Loss of energy, symptoms of burnout, uh, depression, um, or worse, right? So those are, all right. You can group the SDGs along those three dimensions. Kind of, so that's kind of uh, what uh, some colleagues of us uh, did in the uh, uh, United uh, Sustain UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, the first 10 basically kind of more uh, primarily referring to the kind of social dimension, then the next five, 11 through 15, uh, the more kind of environmental, ecological uh, divide. You could say that the last two, right? Peace, justice, you know, how we kind of stitch the whole thing together, how, how we make kind of, how we shift the patterns of collaboration, basically. Um, that has to do with the deeper foundations, right? Kind of, it has to, uh, almost always, to do, you, have, you really have to, um, to, to do work in that, on that level, you have to kind of connect to the deeper sources of identity, of who we are, kind of what's the story of the future, we want to, what are the core values, these kind of things. <coughs> so, um, all right. Probably it's true for you as well. So we all kind of go in and out of many different places and countries. What's the basic feature that we see in almost any country, in almost any community or organization today? It is disruption. And that's kind of what this picture shows, right? So we are kind of, so we are basically, what does disruption mean? Kind of uh, the past is not a good predictor for what the future will look like, right? So there is like, when you picture yourself on the left-hand side there, a current reality, and then the right-hand side, kind of maybe the emerging future, we know more about current reality, left-hand side, less about emerging future, right-hand side. But what we know least about is the process of getting from here to there. So that, in a way, on a country level, on an institutional level, industry level, community level, and that's pretty much the situation anywhere you go. So I think where people really want to help is how, when I face that as an individual, as a team, as an organization, as a country, what do I do? That really has been my own research question the, the past um, 50 plus years that I have tried to explore with experiments and really kind of with building environments that help you to. And the perspective we take kind of from awareness-based systems change or like, like a presencing perspective, right, is that the answer to that question is not only lying outside of yourself. You need to turn around the camera and you need to connect with the deeper levels of your own experience. Because if we connect with the deeper level of our own experience, we discover that there is one part of that experience that's reflecting current reality and another part where we are already operating from the emerging future. It sounds strange, but that's exactly what you hear when you ask innovators about kind of their true story. So it's kind of a deeper exploration. That's really how I, you know, came on. So I have been exploring, interviewing, and studying kind of 150 innovators. Kind of, that's kind of what gave rise to this whole process. So we deal with disruption and kind of we, we want to uh, learn how to be relevant, right, kind of to, 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 to these situations. Okay, disruption happens. That's nothing new. What are the three responses we see across countries today? And I would say it's the same responses across all sectors, systems, countries, and cultures. And here are the three. Number one, uh, basically, um, muddling through, right? Downloading the, you know, continuing the same procedures, right? More of the same. You know, that's, um, that's of course, always kind of one, one response, right? So if we use the 2016 uh, election, who was uh, representing that, right? Very obvious, Hillary Clinton. 
Um, so, uh, and we know when we look at the recent election in Italy and many other places, whoever is associated with that position, right, is going to lose. Because um, what people want is change. And that's why they favor positions that have a more disruptive stance. And that comes in two editions by turning backwards and leaning forward. And turning backwards is basically orienting ourselves in the past in order to make dot, dot, dot great again. So the operating uh, system here is basically freezing. It's a freeze reaction, freezing the mind, closing the mind, the heart, the will, kind of, kind of inside our own boundaries, inside our own walls. So um, Michael Moore, right, he summarized the election with three words, uh, ignorance, hate, and fear. And that's kind of what we see as a political strategy uh, you know, uh, you know, playing out. Um, we, it comes, but it's not limited to the United States, right? It comes with five tangible behaviors that we see all over the place, which are deceiving, 4,713. The number of lies and the misleading statements by President Trump until last week. So 70% uh, is a recent MIT study. Uh, um, false information shared on Twitter is 70% more likely to be reshared than accurate information. All right? So false information is better business. Well, that's kind of uh, another mechanism here. So, so kind of these, uh, now propaganda is not new, but what's new is the weaponizing it kind of with social media, kind of that, you know, uh, 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 brings it to a, to a whole other level of impact. Next number, the next behavior, desensing, the loss of empathy, kind of what I mean with desensing, kind of getting stuck inside our own, um, collective boundaries, right? Us versus them. And kind of, so that's kind of, we see communities breaking apart, right? It's no longer one country, kind of, it's kind of breaking into pieces. 40%, it's the loss of energy uh, among US college students. So for many decades, that has been surveys, constant, constant, constant. And over the past two decades, or, or one and a half decades, kind of the, the, uh, the empathy level dropped by 40% exactly in the time where social media kind of took off. Um, the third one is absencing. What I mean with absencing is basically losing the connection to your highest future potential, kind of losing kind of the connection to your creative core, kind of your, 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 your future, highest future uh, capacities. Uh, and of course, uh, it is very concerning what we see in terms of uh, anxiety disorder and depression, particularly among young people. Kind of one out of four boys, one out of three girls in the U.S. right now. But what is the driver for that? Um, recent study: eighth graders, uh, students, kind of eighth graders that use social media for ten or more hours a week which is not that much, are 56% more likely to have depression and anxiety disorder. 56%. So that's kind of the, um, the impact uh, of uh, social media on, um, on our well-being. Uh, and then, of course, we have blaming others, the inability to reflect, and uh, destruction, eventually self-destruction. Destruction of nature, of others, of institutions, of trust, uh, eventually uh, of ourselves. Uh, so that's one pattern that we see. The other one is basically the inverse of that. That's not freezing the mind, heart, and will, but opening it up. So in other words, uh, amplifying or cultivating curiosity, compassion, and courage. So in my view, which is giving rise to new ecologies, so, so the, the upper reaction to disruption is basically giving rise to an architecture of separation, 
right? Kind of the walls go up, the eight kind of, we, we are kind of just uh, walling ourselves in. Um, it, uh, on the lower half, the opening of the mind, heart, and will, we have uh, architectures of connection, right? Connect, connection and cooperation. So in my view, the result of uh, the, 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 the root cause, right, um, or one of them, for Trumpism is a massive education failure and a massive, you could also say, leadership development failure. Because it is the result of two factors. Number one, disruption happens, right? And disruption is hard. And number two, <coughs> a lack of capacity to do this lower stuff, to open the mind, to open the heart, to open the will in the face of disruption, which is hard to do. But if you, the, if you have these two factors, right, disruption happens and a lack of capacity, um, then you are thrown into this upper space kind of where we are protecting ourselves. We're closing down on the level of the mind, on the level of the heart, and also on the level of our identity, right? We are hanging on, clinging on to something. So um, why do we have institutions of education? Why do we have... Um, leadership development and all these things to learn this stuff right to learn how to deal with uh, uh, disruption in a way that is not kind of throwing you back into the past um, but of course that's kind of uh, a claim kind of that's not the actual reality the reality kind of these capacities are socialized out of us right uh, through professional training and through much of um, uh, educational experiences but it's of course the reason why we're here, right? I, I think that's kind of, uh, um, that, that's a critical role uh, we have to play. So summing up here, uh, basically kind of uh, situation analysis, what is actually going on in terms of the three responses. I would say our current age is defined by these three words. And that's now just the collective dimension of what I just showed, which is post-truth, post-democracy, and post human Post-truth, I already explained, right? 4,713 and very only insignificant drop in uh, popularity among his voters, right? Uh, Post-democracy uh, is another topic, but we all know kind of the crisis of democracy. Uh, and we know that, you know, our, our communities are breaking apart, right? Kind of so, so that there is a really need to renew the foundations and not only restore democracy but advance democracy um, and then uh, post-human is really the role of technology kind of that you know it's kind of the, the impact of AI not only on well-being but on the essence of our humanity uh, and what future we really want to I believe kind of uh, Rachel Carson got kind of the silent spring that was a topic right? it gave rise to the sustainability movement some when was it 60 years ago uh, 50, 60. Uh, it was basically the impact of the you know, uh, 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 inadvertent uh, 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 impact of technology on nature. Right? And today we see the other shoe drop, right? the impact of technology on our mind and on our well being, on the essence of our humanity, on, on our inner nature. And both of these things, I think, will define this entry. Kind of, uh, it's not only uh, the sustainability agenda kind of, that we are more aware of today. So what is, if, if we say this crisis defined by these uh, three words, post-truth, of these three conditions, post-truth, post-democracy, and post-human. So what is, um, what is that calling for? If we say that's a transitioner, it's a moment of transition, it's an evolutionary uh, maybe transition, so yet another state of our own evolution. So what is being called for here? I believe three things. So what is our agenda, so to speak? Three things, which is new learning infrastructures, right? That's kind of the answer to post truth. New learning infrastructure, which are not only revolving around the mind, but also kind of for cultivating the opening of the heart and the opening of the will. So you could say whole person and whole systems uh, yeah, infrastructures of learning. Secondly, new democratic infrastructures to uh, make democracy more direct, more distributed, and more dialogic. 
kind of more with features that where that help us to uh, begin to see ourselves as, as, as a larger system. And the third one is new economic infrastructures that allow us to shift the current economy that's uh, structured and organized around ecosystem awareness to one that's organized around ecosystem awareness, by which I mean kind of well-being of all and, and of the whole. So I want to now double click on, on, on the last one here. So the, uh, <coughs> the uh, new economic infrastructures and just give you uh, uh, and I will go through that very quickly. This is just an overview here, kind of there's more written stuff. And you know most of these things anyhow, so it's not really that, that new, uh, I assume. And, uh, but it is kind of um, uh, reporting out of a new initiative uh, that uh, Benjamin was uh, uh, referencing, the Transforming Capitalism Lab. Personally, it's like, uh, so really that title kind of so that, you know, because usually you drive all funders and everyone away, right? And I will be using such a term, right? So you really want to use that? But I believe um, that um, maybe we are with uh, transformation of capitalism there where uh, 40 years ago, where we, where we were with sustainability, right? It's, it's in the beginning, it sounds a little radical for some, but what's the problem with the SDGs? They're all good. I mean, and I do everything kind of to, but are we really talking about the deeper systemic issues, right? And that conversation we need to have because systems thinking means reacting against the symptoms is not enough. Now I'm not saying SDGs the symptoms, but it's like, all I'm saying is we need to really be uh, more methodical in, in talking and more honest in talking about the deeper root issues. Uh, uh, the um, uh, root issues, yes. So let me kind of do a quick Fly over. So, in my own view, kind of this is kind of uh, a, a big emerging topic. So, we are at the beginning now, but for a number of reasons, most of which you're aware of, um, there isn't really that much productive thinking going on, right? So, you have like some ideological responses to uh, transformation of capitalism, very weak in terms of solution, and kind of, and most business schools uh, think they are being paid for, so I'm not asking these questions. So. So there is like, um, there's a real kind of part leader gap, right? And you guys have been with the you know, um, a development report, and so you have been really pushing the global discourse, the global awareness, uh, you know, in, in earlier years. I think kind of, so I'm offering that also to you as a possibility. Hey, if you really want to take a stance, if you really want to ask some of the right <coughs> questions that we need to find solutions for, uh, that could be, um, uh, you know, that could be maybe an input at least to that conversation. So here's how I think about the transformation of capitalism, which is that it's a set of seven different acupuncture points. So the transformation of capitalism is already happening, um, but it's happening in separate discourses and separate experiments, and we need to really bring them together. And the seven acupuncture points is basically following a production function. So I'm kind of going quickly uh, uh, through that here. The first one, of course, has to do with nature. And it's basically uh, rethinking the economy from linear to, uh, to circular. Um, the number, right, uh, 1.7, we use 1.7 minus 100% is Today's conventional agriculture, right? One dollar of agriculture production has another dollar of negative externalities today, most of which are health and uh, water treatment. So it's not even the groundwater, the deeper accounting there, but, but that's kind of uh, where we are. So, um, uh, and uh, I see a lot of traction around of uh, the regenerative agriculture and of course also energy there's really it was always an important topic but now you really get people's attention i think it's something emerging that is very relatable also from a local that uh needs more uh required uh, not deserves more attention then uh labor of course right you know the number 47 percent kind of, of jobs being replaced by ai and uh, technology and, and the next year employment, right? It's not going to happen, right? We need to totally rethink that. UBI is maybe one example of, of doing that. And 
Um, so and it's already happening. Um, so it's already in the making. But you know, it's um, you know, it's just one piece, and you know, um, also deserves, I think, um, more. What well, UBI for me is basically the separation between income and work, right? Which would allow us to link work much more with passion and impact, right? And uh, so there is like, um, so I think it is challenging thought conventions among economists in an interesting way. And that's kind of where kind of we, um, uh, we see the beginning of an interesting conversation. I'm not convinced that this is the solution for everything. There's like many problems with that as well. But it's interesting because it's challenging our, uh, our thought habits kind of uh, uh, that comes from traditional economic theory. Capital, right? What's the problem here? We have too much capital in one place, speculation, and too little in another place, uh, which is the regeneration of all our commons, right? And that's the big problem. And we need to address it directly. Uh, there's various ways how you can do it, but you know, one example is um, Ant Forest, right? From Ant Financial, kind of the, the, the app Ant Forest, they were successful. So Ant Financial, as you know, is the, the, the financial arm of Alibaba, the biggest fintech uh, company. They succeeded in making 220 million Chinese users participate in reforestation activity. It's a really interesting way how private sector can actually become a force for good uh, in terms of SEG um, uh, uh, impact uh, acceleration. Uh, but the more general point here is relinking the flow of capital with our intention, individual intention, but also public intention. I think that's kind of where we need discourse, experiments, um, and um, a whole kind of a much more direct way to talk about the real issue there, right? We don't need more need projects on the ground. We need to address this issue if we are really serious with the 17 SDGs in 2030. Um, number four, technology. I mentioned uh, 56%. Um, so think about kind of the person you uh, love most in your life, right? How often a day do you touch that person? Uh, okay. You, Memorize that number, and then how often do you touch your device? Right. 2,617. That's a one-year-old uh, study. It's already outdated, and that was low boring, right? It's the average user. So um, technology. So what's kind of the big, the big topic here? From addictive to co-creative. Of course, technology is neither good nor evil. It depends on what we do with it. But uh, if it's used for empire building and just profit maximiz maximization, we see these impacts that, uh, and uh, if we use it for well-being and accessing and activating our deeper creative capacity, very, but you know, it will not happen automatically. Silicon Valley tells, uh, you no, know, is demonstrating that every single day. So we need to have another public discourse here. Uh, and uh, that's where, uh, we all need to work together, I think, and, and those are um, challenging conversations. <laughs> Management, of course, we all know that, right? You know, that's where many problems come from, right? Uh, the global workforce, so one third uh, globally today are engaged, two thirds are disengaged or uh, really unsupported, right? So that's kind of the, this current state, right? We basically lost two thirds of our people. And um, it has to do with hierarchies and silos and so on. And the big question on the table is, how do you manage and lead in an ecosystem environment? Right? So how do you do that? So what, what are the supporting environments for that? And that's, of course, also part of what brings us here. Consumption, of course, um, GNH, gross net national happiness is more important than GDP. I think you guys with the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, UNDP development uh, index, kind of, you have been like pioneers, right, for pushing that discussion. <coughs> and you know, there's not a lack really of indicators, maybe today, there's kind of more, but is it really used, right? And is it, you know, so, so, so we know it, it's still, even though we have done, you have done, we have done all these things, there's still kind of too much over focus on, on GDP. So that's 
uh, of course, uh, uh, well known to everyone. And then the last one, coordination governments, right? What is capitalism at the end of the day? Or what's the modern economy, right? It's division of labor, right? That's where productivity is coming from. So the big question is, how do you stitch the whole thing together? Throughout economic history, we have seen three responses, three coordination mechanisms. The visible hand, right, kind of state, kind of socialism or mercantilism. The invisible hand, kind of uh, market and competition, of course. And the third one is organized interest groups, right, kind of, kind of so stakeholder groups coming together, evolving the regulatory framework and so on. Um, and what's most interesting today, I believe, is that we see the birth of a fourth coordination mechanism, which is acting and coordinating by seeing the whole. I could also say uh, ABC, awareness-based collective action. So it is coordinating not by you know visible or invisible hand, but by coordinating by <coughs> looking together by what we do basically in stakeholder processes, right? Looking together at the same situation, you know, developing a shared understanding, systems thinking, and then kind of organizing around how to learn by doing in terms of addressing some of these issues, right? So that's basically what we do, and I think it's a coordination mechanism because it creates like. Uh, a shared awareness, right, or con a shared consciousness, or a shared way of seeing at the situation, which then has a, allows us to directly coordinate. In disaster response, that's what we do, right? We come together, we look at the situation, and spontaneously we coordinate what's necessary. But in the bigger complex issues, it's more, more difficult, right? So um, that's basically the seven agriculture points, I think, where. Uh, Capitalism is transforming as we speak, and where we need a more, uh, I think, uh, systematic conversation uh, about kind of what's currently working, what's not, where are prototypes, you know, of new ways of, of operating, and you know, and, and and also kind of linking these seven conversations uh, uh, with uh, each other, which is basically what we true, uh, try to, to to be in support of there. So the last point. I want to make is um, uh, something uh, which connects to recent experiences I've had over the past few weeks and with the current moment we are living in and, and the current moment of possibility also to catalyze collective change at a level that is way beyond what we currently see and that we know is necessary. <coughs> so, um, I have, um, uh, uh, over the past few weeks, I have had events uh, like uh, in um, Milano, in uh, Jakarta, and uh, also in Western Australia, where kind of I saw sort of a little bit like a new pattern, kind of that where, um, you know, uh, where I felt kind of that there is a dormant potential in many communities of change, in many kind of place-based communities that can be much more easily activated than we have previously thought. So, um, for example, in, uh, in, in Jakarta, it kind of was kind of the, the top 700 people there uh, of the government, but then, you know, uh, also, you know, some other groups are more, you know, including some uh, multi-stakeholder representation there as well. So, long story short, this is kind of um, a slide that I showed at these occasions. Um, which is, and it's only a very short event, it's like one day event. And um, this slide is the one page summary of what um, theory really is. So it's basically the four levels of change, individual, kind of when you look uh, across the columns, it's the individual, the team, uh, the organization, and the larger system. And on the vertical dimension, you basically have the different levels of awareness or consciousness, or you could say the different patterns of relationship. And the first one is habitual way, kind of same old, same old, kind of um, reenacting the, the existing patterns. And the fourth one, kind of uh, at the bottom, is co-creativity, right, on an ecosystem level, kind of where new patterns emerge. And the other ones are uh, in between. So I basically showed this, and I said, okay, so... They are like on the individual, the different levels of listening, kind of on the team level, you have the different levels of uh, conversation, kind of from debate to dialogue and so forth. 
we have the different levels of <coughs> organizing on an organizational level from centralized, decentralized network and ecosystem, number four. And then, of course, the um, uh, on the coordination level, kind of uh, on the whole system level, you have what I just described, right? Kind of visible hand, invisible hand, you know, the interest groups, and then kind of awareness-based connected thought and action. So, all right, so question is, for everyone, where are you? Because we, each of us, is enacting all these levels every moment, right? So that's kind of, and then, you know, uh, in real time, this is what people said. So in your organization and team, what is your primary mode of operating? That was the question I asked. And you, you tend to get the same responses uh, across places. And here's kind of a, a, a depiction of that. Basically, people say, most of the time, so it's color coded here, it's percentage points. So the, per, the percentage of each column is 100, right? So, so you see kind of, uh, and the dark colors are the highest percentage numbers. So basically people say, most of the time we spend level one and two. So same old, same old, basically, right? Uh, Reenacting old patterns uh, as individuals and in, in teams and organizations, but also in the larger system. Um, then next question. In order to appropriately respond to the challenges that you currently face right now, right? What, what's the level you needed to, you know, you should be operating. And basically, they all say the same. It's level four and some of level three. And then I said, wait a minute. You just told me kind of, this is what you should be doing, right? Level four. And, but this is what you are actually doing. Right, so th this is what you say you do, which is level four, and what you actually do is the opposite of that because there's almost nothing on level four, and most of, <coughs> most of the time is level one and two. Why? Well, I mean, my first reaction would be, isn't it situational? I mean, to some degree, I mean, if I'm ordering a cup of coffee, I'm not. Okay, okay. so, so let, let me just finish. Um, okay. So the it was not ordering coffee, so I, yeah. I was asking, so, given the current challenges that you face right. okay. as an individual, as a team, and so on, what is what would be the appropriate level? Okay. Kind of yeah. Dominant. It's, it's not like 100%, but dominant. So, here's so the question then is why is it that you say you should be doing uh, number four, right? So, 60, 60, 70, 80%, but in reality, you only spend 10, 8, 7, or 11% there. Why? What's holding your bank? And here's what they said. Time, fear, culture, capitalism. Uh, next question. Okay, if you would commit yourself to make it happen, right? What you think should be happening right now, given your current challenges, what would it take? And the answer is courage, support, Time, confidence. Last question. If you would commit yourself to making that happen, so it's basically the second answer is really courage, courage, and courage, right? So, um, and some support. So, what, so the last question is what kind of support would really help you to make it happen? And this is uh, what people say trust, understanding, openness, money. Collaboration, empathy, belief, empowerment. So it's an interesting list because most of that is actually quite scalable and organizable. So if you organize in an intelligent way, that's actually quite doable. Uh, so that's basically kind of a way of making the system see itself, right? So, so you ask these questions and thereby you turn their attention. Uh, back on top their own way of operating and that's remember kind of that was one of my three sentences making the system see itself kind of that's kind of the, the essence or an important aspect of uh, systems thinking but of course there are others kind of so going through this what we call the you process of going in learning journeys with multi-stakeholder groups having deep reflection processes and then running prototypes that's kind of another way of kind of um, you know, having the same experience, which is making the system see itself. 
This is uh, uh, an example here of the leadership team of Ant Financial, kind of the, the company I mentioned before, making learning journeys into all the kind of relevant pockets that they are, you know, are, are dealing with and then coming together and sharing everything. So it's really, it's not just abstractly talking about a situation, but feeling it, experiencing it, kind of being one-on-one -on -one with uh, many of these stakeholders. Or kind of uh, in, a, in a modeling here with another multi-stakeholder group, the Call Triangle Initiative, where kind of uh, then kind of through some kind of role play, including kind of Mother Earth here. So he's a banker in his real life. But uh, <laughs> when we do these role play, kind of you always include Mother Nature, so kind of uh, the ecological divide, and all the marginalized groups, right, or some of them, right, to bring in kind of the social divide as well. And you also, on that spiritual side, we, we bring usually kind of some emerging future. Scenario thinking, right? Kind of scenario practices, bringing all the stakeholders in. I'm sure you have done that many times. It's another method, right? Kind of that can, you can use to make a system sense and see itself in, in, in the current uh, uh, context. So uh, what I want to end with is what is it that and where what I really mean with systems thinking on a uh, you know, more operational level. And why is, why, uh, so what is the current moment really and the current moment of opportunity? So if you use kind of the smartphone, so most people when they think about change, they think about like adding another app here, kind of that does certain things. And what I would be claiming is that's not systems thinking. Systems thinking would mean to update the operating system. And that's kind of, in fact, what we need in all our key societal systems today. And I want to exemplify that very quickly. So the 1.0 is input-centric operating systems. In health, it's kind of traditional doctor-centric medicine and, you know, traditional ways of learning as well. We kind of start with these two. That's the old model. The current model is output and efficiency-centric. Right? You run the system through output and efficiency. So it's um, evidence-based medicine. It's um, testing-based teaching. Also known as bulimia learning, right? Fast in, fast out. Kind of. So in other words, the absence of learning, right? So you're just kind of, you know, it's just learning for testing, but not, um, uh, but not real learning. What's the good school today? Kind of what's the 3.0 model? Outcome and user centric. So it's not output, but outcome, kind of the user perspective. It's patient centric medicine, learner centric architectures of learning. That's the current good model. But I believe it's not the future because to go on the next level, the, the 4.0, um, we need to strengthen the source of well being. It's not just kind of patient centric medicine, it's kind of really. Uh, addressing kind of the sources of health and well-being and strengthening them and kind of in learning it's kind of really activate kind of the deeper sources of, of learning and creativity farm and food same evolution traditional farmer centric industrial agriculture monoculture kind of all the uh, you know the source of all the environmental issues then 3.0 is organic agriculture reduce the negative footprint but it's not the future the future is food as medium for healing the planet and people. So it's increasing the positive uh, 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 footprint, not just kind of reducing the negative uh, footprint. In finance, same thing. Traditional financial capital, extractive capital, externality blind, impact investing, kind of usually focusing just on one or two topics, totally ignorant of the larger system. And the 4.0 would be really systems transformation. Corporate sustainability, uh, same thing, right? Alleviating projects, kind of uh, that we have. We 2.0 is you know more co you know practices, recycling and sustainability. 3.0 is as a source for business innovation. Yet not really addressing the key issues, right? Like sustainable uh, uh, mobility and so on. And the 4.0 would be really kind of uh, addressing and transforming the, the root issues of uh, these systemic things. So what I'm suggesting here is, uh, as you can see, a differentiation between 3.0 and 4.0. And 3.0 is basically innovation as more of the same. You have something good, and you think about scaling in terms of, let's do more of that. And that's not 
because <coughs> hope wants zero is not just kind of more of the good things, more of the same, but it's really transforming the system, right? Understanding the whole system, understanding the root issues, and transforming them, and kind of that's what you are. Uh, I uh, see on the uh, uh, 4.0 uh, level here. So, um, yeah, so that's basically uh, what I had. So we are building support infrastructures for that. I think it's it may be quite similar to what you are doing. So we, we think about our work in terms of three things, the labs, right, on, on for example, SDGs. Uh, focusing on that. Then we have capacity building mechanisms, right, which I'm sure kind of you also do uh, a lot of online to offline platforms here. And then uh, there's, of course, uh, research and, you know, learning and kind of uh, developing methods and tools, kind of the, the, the development. Um, so we are um, uh, uh, launching this week a strategy with, with you know, in, in terms of uh, the transforming capitalism that is a strategy where we not only invite people to go on a journey and um, create their own circuits of change, but where we can want to convene them on ecosystem activation festivals. So one or two day events where we bring together all the innovators from the region in order for them to experience that the future is already there, which is exactly what I saw kind of in these uh, events that I was mentioning before. I think there's a big opportunity in the world right now. There's so many of the solutions already there, but they are not connected. And if we bring them together like uh, on an ecosystem level, like for example, on a country level, and kind of make them aware of each other and kind of and, you know uh, allow them to activate kind of some of the um, um, uh, and become aware kind of, of, of some of the innovations that they are having, um, uh, we believe we can really activate kind of this dormant future potential that you know, uh, I think many of us are feeling in the world today, but that isn't quite activated. So um, one enabling condition, of course, is online and platform and all these things, but our experience is that's not even half. To really have the impact, you need um, a new breed of offline uh, gatherings that are very systemic <coughs> and practical on the one hand, kind of where kind of you showcase the great example of what's happening, and very personal on the other hand. So where kind of you get beyond the blah, blah, blah. It's much more engaging, much more appropriate, much more also kind of connecting to our, uh, our, the essence of our own humanity. Kind of, and, and I think kind of we have like a, we prototyped uh, uh, two or uh, uh, so of these things, and we would uh, and we want to make that a key point of our strategy going forward. We want to do in all major uh, uh, world regions one of those designed for replication <coughs> within the next two years. So it will be designed for replication that uh, anyone going there can actually take these principles, kind of can take that and replicate that in their own context. So that's kind of one of the things we are currently working on and kind of that would, um, if there is some overlap with what you're about to do, uh, would be a wonderful possibility to partner and collaborate around. Thank you, Otto. We schedule this for an hour, so if you have to leave, just please feel free to leave. Uh, no bad feelings at all, as this is a 60-minute session. Um, I'd say we open the floor for question and answers. Do you prefer taking several questions or one by one? Let's see. We can like maybe two, three. Maybe they are connected. All so right. Let's take a few kind of so that we see the, the connectivity first. Let's take three at a time. If you can say your name and where you work, either in the organization or elsewhere, and if it's a question and a statement, keep the statement part rather short, please. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Hi, my name is Sandra Lee. I'm from Germany. Uh, I work for a and And I have a question. I'll try to speak brief. Um, it does require a bit of explanation. So it, it's related to the school of thought that mission-oriented approaches to development might be a better way of pushing out the narrative that you alluded to is not rich in people and so there's an urgency that we need to achieve the SDG. So the idea of moonshots um, as a means to be able to direct 
innovation directed action um, would be solving problems would be um, help in, in our common effort to, to basically to achieving the SDGs. Um, and the logic is incremental approaches won't do it, need radical changes around that. Um, my question is, does that mean would that approach, which is somewhat um, well, gaining traction not only in business schools but more and more in the public sector as well, would that mean tinkering around the edges, or is that could that potentially be a mean of, of looking at systemic change as you as you propose? Because whereas a mission would help rally, um, you know societies, countries around a very concrete goal and allow for different ways of getting there in a way that potentially the big challenges of the SDGs are not spurring enough movement um, towards. But it, the, you know, is that the kind of transformation, can that lead to the same level of transformation that you're, that you're calling for or not? Sorry. Let's take two more and then we'll head back to you, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks, Otto. It's very interesting. Uh, my name's Doug Webb. I'm working on public health here. Um, structural driver, social determinants of health, SDG3 orientated. Using your language and where we find ourselves stuck much of the time is this whole business of externalities. And we find when you're working across sectors that the externalities of one sector are then the problems inherited by another, in my case, the health sector. Um, so we constantly come up against this problem of externality identification and costing in a situation where um, the power imbalance actually just denigrates the perspective of the health se sector. Now, our practical solution to this is to do return on investment analysis to actually um, appeal to a higher authority, in this case, the Ministry of Finance, to look at a whole of system cost analysis, which should empower the health sector to make an argument. Um, but when we're doing these um, stakeholder discussions around costs and benefits and returns on investment, we come back to this idea of, of a consciousness as a, or a collective intention which we find is very difficult to break through in the absence of good leadership and sectoral incentive structures, which don't accord with each other. So, I mean, that's where, that's our day-to-day -day reality, working yeah. in about 30 countries. And I'm just sort of throwing out that problem of basically externalities being lost, um, trying to cost them for the benefit of one discussant when the incentive structure doesn't allow for that collective solutions approach and i'm wondering whether that's common across all issues or whether it's i'm sure it's not unique to the health sector but it's something we experience a lot thanks well, i think first thank you that was fantastic and uh, felt to me like you were channeling uh, rudolf steiner the, the, the side conversation uh, there's a lot of language and a lot of uh, yeah so I'm, I'm part of that community so um my question actually is very much along the same lines. Uh, when, I mean, there's a lot of talk about complex integrated problems and trying to, to tackle those rather than working in silos. And this is where we are as an organization right now. Um, and the question is how, and how do you create the spaces? And I think you gave some examples, but I'd like if you could maybe talk us through a place where you've been involved. I mean, not you, but your institution for a bit of time and kind of both creating the space and, and sort of the movement and, and some of the change because we're looking at how we organize ourselves to tackle these types of complex issues but I we all know that it's not going to be sort of a one week two week type of thing it's going to be a longer term engagement and there's a sort of an organizational challenge of how do you as an institution, international institution, how do you organize yourself to really be useful in this space? And of course, that includes partnering with institutions like yours. Thanks. Okay, so uh, uh, maybe um, to, uh, in an attempt to uh, uh, connect with the three uh, questions, but also comment. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, so 
Uh, I mean, absolutely. So there's all real change processes take uh, many years. Uh, everyone knows that. It's just a, a, a little bit disconnected from the funding cycle. That's always the problem. And um, but, you know, everyone who has uh, participated in anything real knows that. But we also know it's possible uh, to do these things. Uh, I would say um, so. So what will be a concrete example? So uh, uh, the uh, maternal health in Namibia, you know, so that, that was an issue. You have multi stakeholder processes, you need to develop trust, and you go through that, you develop prototypes, then they are scaled. And you can also build the capacities that they are residing then in the country that the whole thing continues kind of after the, um, the, the cycle actually has ended. Now, but you know, it takes like, uh, I don't know, it was maybe four or five years, the whole thing kind of was, um, and uh, it is possible, yet, kind of coming uh, um, back to your uh, point, we also know that, you know, in terms of the healthcare system is only, uh, I think, 25 or 30 percent of, of, of really the uh, uh, factors that um, determine our quality of health. Uh, uh, so all the other ones are all outside of the healthcare system. And that's kind of, I think, the, the externality question that that you raise. So that's kind of the bigger question, really, on the table. And um, is the reason why I shared the last matrix, kind of the systems evolution matrix, kind of moving from 3.0 to 4.0, right? That's why I shared that, because 4.0, right? So what happens is the boundaries collapse between health, learning, um, uh, food, farming, um, and uh, you know, you could also say finance and business. Kind of, there is like you know at least kind of open boundaries there. So what's missing today in society? We know that we know kind of these things. We know that kind of most of the factors to contribute to health is actually reinventing the way we work, right? Kind of that's kind of we need to transform business to really deliver on uh, what you're working on. But where is kind of where do we have that space? And I think that's where. Uh, that opens up a new possibility for place-based communities. Uh, it, it, it's really um, what we see not happening is, and that relates to the moonshot question, right? If you just bring the educators together and they think about kind of the future, nothing good is going to happen from that. So what we actually need is a much more diverse, where all the four or five sectors that I just mentioned kind of come together, particularly the, the people kind of that want to take it to the next level of systems evolution. And uh, moonshot is good, except that in reality, it's often used by technology companies and you know all the money is kind of moving in, in, in technology. And I think what we all know is, yes, technology is a key part in helping making a system sentence itself. It's this mirroring function. A lot has to do with data, actually, can be great. But it's not the only thing. There's something more important than that, which is the social technologies, kind of the awareness-based social technologies that allow us to connect and to pay attention and to converse and you know and make sense kind of in a more distributed and in a more collective way. And that also needs uh, to be supported. So I think there is, and that's um, why towards the end um, uh, of the conversation, I uh, just showed kind of this. Uh, it's actually an airstrip kind of uh, temple hall in Berlin, right? So in the center of Berlin, you have kind of this old airport that's no longer, and that could be, that's actually a project we are currently discussing is to turning that into an innovation part of the society of the future, where kind of, for example, these sectors that we just mentioned would be reinvented and kind of, and where you would kind of bring the innovators together kind of and give them a support structure. I think that's what we need, kind of the, the marginal, we don't want to kind of disconnect that to the larger institution, but you need innovations happen in places. And you need, we need new quality of places, kind of that, you know, it has to do with physical, it has to do with purpose, it has to do with nature, with kind of the, the enabling, kind of how you can run social processes there. Uh, you know, in normal times, we would say, well, that's a university or, or something like that. But the old universities are not set up at all kind of to play that function. So, so we need kind of this enabling infrastructure. And that's, I think, when you think about the accelerators or the innovation labs or the platforms, it needs that also place-based and physical 
uh, dimension kind of where kind of the you can activate the social field. So in, in, a, in a way, what I try to say today is with the, the first slide kind of the, uh, or the whole talk really also, awareness-based systems change. What does it really mean? It means if you really want to change something, you need to change the social field. And you need to, uh, you know, and for that, you need places kind of where you can feel it. You move into that and then uh, you can experience it there and then it's much easier to bring it back into some of the bigger institutions that we also need, right? So that's kind of, so moonshot for me is less kind of, this is because the reality is the less you know about the future, kind of uh, the more idiotic a, a moonshot can be, right? Because, you know, the, the moonshot is good if you already know where you want to go, right? For example, to the moon, right? <laughs> but if you don't know, right? then it's a great way of mobilizing massive resources that are fully wasted, right? So I would say the moonshot, right? I like the, the radical part of it because you need new developmental environments, right? But we need to organize them in the way that are organized around uh, something that's emerging, right? Not kind of that's already predefined. And that's kind of, so we need new holding spaces, kind of new, new ecosystems where these um, innovations that cut across all the sectoral boundaries are really supported and where you can kind of think in a more radical way that, you know, I think you're referring to. Okay, let me stop you here. We do two more questions from the room. We have one question online. Are there any more questions in the room? If not, I'll hand to the question online. Oh. Else has one. Oh. One on the okay, before doing that, if you're interested for further reading in the topic, in addition to Otto's books, what I really recommend is Donut Economics from Kate Rockford. She makes the point that the way we speak about economics and the environment, including the metaphor, are super important, including that notion of negative externalities. She argues that in a system, there are no side effects, they're just effects. And that, that term of negative externalities was used too long by economists and policymakers for that artificial distinction between the economy and the environment. And I think that's a really good argument. Maybe that could penetrate UNDP in our language on that. So I first go with the question from Rosemary and then Paul. Rosemary is our director for sustainable development. And she says, Otto, <coughs> I imagine you'll ask us where we see UNDP today. Can you reflect? Frankly, and I guess briefly, where you see UNDP and the change processes that have been set in motion in respect to the slide that you showed earlier that you used for the participants at the event in Indonesia. That's well, Rosemary, and let's hand over to Mine's Mine's a slightly different um, uh, area. Thank you so much. It was a really fantastic um, presentation. It got me thinking about lots of different things. But one I wanted to concentrate on. Uh, my name is Paul. I work in leadership development at UNDP. And so some of the kind of the more human aspects that you mm. described and kind of the uh, the trends, I think you said the kind of failure of education, the failure of leadership development that might have led us to this particular political moment really uh, got me thinking about you know, kind of the closing off and certain examples of leaders doing things in one way, which yeah. see, many, many people seem to appreciate and go for versus kind of what we might need in the future to to get to this, um, this, this better state. So just wondering on how how optimistic you are that we can get to that better state and kind of resist those bad impulses and what we need, what we might need to do. Someone working in a job like me, for example, what will we need to, to think about for developing leaders within UNDP or developing leaders globally who, who, are, who are fit for this, this better future that we're trying to get towards? Wow, big, uh, big, big question. So, um, on the first one, so I think, you know, I have very little experience uh, in UNDP, so it's kind of, um, it would be really uh, very, um, um, uh, just, you know, uh, you know, it would be strange if I could, you know, um, if I would uh, assess that based on the little experience that I have, the, the level, I think that's something you, you should be doing. But uh, if I just kind of mirror the conversations I had and where I asked questions like that, so, so the responses that I heard were, were probably more the first uh, two, maybe three levels, right? 
But then in reality, I think that it's also true. So for example, we uh, discussed a, a specific case right before the session here, where it seemed to be more like a, a level four approach there. So I think what the reality is, uh, in a big organization is not in one place, but if you have kind of all these um, levels. Uh, but uh, what I heard your colleagues saying is uh, you need more of level four. It is there in some places, right, where something new happens. Uh, usually that's not exactly the headquarters, right? So, um, but, you know, more in the field, more kind of where you can re bring the real stakeholders together. But, you know, there are episodes uh, like that. And then the, the question would be how to strengthen that, right? And, uh, and I think that's kind of the, the conversation we're having here. And it relates to, to your point. Uh, also, I mean, I don't know whether you meant it that way, but I heard also, because conventional innovation thinking is, yeah, kind of so, do the moonshot, kind of you have kind of the crazies here, kind of they, they're allowed to do everything, and then they come up with something, and then the executives look at that and so on. So it all looks great, while in reality, when you talk to people, every, everyone is pissed, right? Because it's disempowering everyone else. Uh, because it's only these chosen people, right, kind of who have all these possibilities, and what about us, and what about my idea? And so I, I'm going more into the underground. Thing or disengage from the situation. So I think uh, it's also, um, uh, and you know, I mean, what is here in America, the Trump situation, too much attention on one place, too little in another place. And when, when you look at leadership development, right, usually it's, there's too much attention to the top, basically, and too little to, uh, uh, maybe to the front line. Usually, I don't know actually whether it's true for UNDP, but generally, I think that's a, there, there's a risk for that. So um, I would say how to think, I mean, that's how I heard your question, how to think in more inclusive ways about uh, how we offer these um, capacity building environments. And when we think about radical innovation and moonshot and so on, how can we do it in a way that is not really disempowering everyone else, uh, who is not part of the moonshot team, right? <laughs> but, you know, really kind of allows them. So, so, yes, we need these places, right? So, so these airstrip there where the Berlin airlift happened. But uh, we need more free access to that as well, right? It's not only kind of a, a small uh, elite group that's there. So, so these sorts of design questions, I think it's, uh, we do need to think about the whole system. And, I work uh, quite a bit in, uh, also with bigger organizations, and I am like, um, including like very, um, you know, like Chinese government and big uh, global corporations, and you know, so places where you would not um, expect any any radical aspiration towards um, sustainability and green and kind of the future of humanity, and but and, and consciousness, right? No one is interested you know, in consciousness and transformation and meditation and these kind of things. And I am, I tell you, I am shocked how open people are. The next generation of leaders, um, how open they are when you just offer them something practical, right? Kind of, it's not fake, but you can expand. Where, uh, to explore the deeper levels of their own experience and kind of the, the deeper aspects of their own journey of uh, not only as a leader, but as a human being, right? And, the story of the future. So I think the uh, the opportunity, the developmental opportunity, there's many people who's from the outside, they look totally conventional and totally, it's just kind of by accident, they haven't been exposed to developmental opportunities that allow them to open up. But if you offer these um, developmental opportunities, many of them are really quite interested and also able, right? So we had, we launched three years ago ULAB as a global online offline platform. It was a big risk because until then, the conventional wisdom was transformation is possible, but the dirty little secret is it's very expensive, right? It only works in small groups with a lot of work and holding, right? So that's why it's so limited. We can only do it for the top. That's really. So what we, the, the experiment that we did, ULAB, putting everything out for free and um, basically radical decentralization of the classroom saying, you do it yourself, right? Here are all the tools, and here are ways how you can connect them. <laughs> we orchestrate that a little bit, right? And we were blown away, you know, how many people were willing and able 
to really create kind of quality. So in hundreds of hubs in, in, in places around the world. So over 100,000 people participated in, in a, over the last uh, three years. So it gives you an indicator that the way we thought about leadership development and all these golden rules and so on, it's all no longer true because the crisis of our time, right, and also creates an openness on the level of consciousness that's much bigger than it used to be in the, uh, in the past. So I think I'm mainly um, surprised by how little boundaries I need, right, which tells me I'm not courageous enough, right, because you need, you should get some pushback, right. So, and we are too much basing all our golden rules on the past, which no longer applies. So that's my feeling, right? But there's a lot more possible today, which wasn't there just a few years ago. So I think uh, that's where we need more like moonshot type of uh, approaches that in a way allow these new learning spaces to become available to many more people. It's not everyone for sure, mm -hmm. but you can't tell from the outside who it is. And where. Yeah. Let's end on that good note. Before I release you, I want to say a big thank you to you, Otto. want to make a plug for our latest publication where we look at missions as an open-ended thing, like Carbon Neutral City by 2030, where you can go many different routes in your innovation, but also combined with puddle jumps. If it includes the electrification of mobility, for example, that would include getting everybody on the grid, on the grid and every village electrified. Share it with friends and family, share it with open-minded colleagues and foreign ministries and foundations who want to support innovation. And during the GA, we're going to host three events, one on innovation ecosystems and social entrepreneurship for our friends from Impact Hub, one on innovation where we'll talk a lot about mission um, together with Denmark. They will be the CEO of Nesta, Jeff Mulgan, a great thinker together with Anne and Anne Mei Cheng, great thinker, just released a new book. And lastly, one on experimentation and behavior change with Professor Claire Sunstein, co-author of Nudge. And we hope to see you at one or the other for those. Otto. So, yeah, maybe um, uh, two more quick plugs. So, if, uh, as a follow-on, kind of, so, kind of, the one book is actually, it's not the review. It's kind of, this one would be the one recommended. It just came out, uh, the, uh, the Essentials of the Review. And that kind of, that would be a, a follow-on reading on, on some of the discussions. And... Uh, the website, um, so I, I will make kind of the slides uh, uh, available, but you know, I think the website with a lot of kind of uh, practical tools uh, and so forth is presencing.org. Uh, I think that's kind of where, uh, for those of you who want to kind of apply some of these things, um, uh, there is also the MIT XU Lab, kind of it's a free online environment. Lots of tools, all of them freely downloadable and kind of um, uh, blendable with whatever you use uh, already in your toolkit. So, so those will be the three things that uh, maybe we also put in the follow-up. Thanks a lot, everyone. We are on the 16th floor. The door is always open. Thank you, Eddie. And and thanks, sorry. everyone, online. We'll show this one. And this one was. <laughs> Thank you.